allow us to remind you that we are speaking about the an introduction to the heart of the Dhamma. Yesterday we didn't finish, so today we will continue. Let us review a few things about the stream of dependent origination so that you will understand it more clearly and thoroughly. You ought to know that the principle of Paticca Samupata can be applied to things without life, that is, inanimate things. And it can be applied or seen also in living things, in animate things. Now we are speaking specifically about dependent origination as it applies to animate things. But it's still the same matter, it's the same truth. But when we examine how it manifests in the world, we can distinguish two aspects as it applies to inanimate things and as it applies to inan to animate things, inanimate and animate things. If we want to understand anything, even inanimate things like industry or agriculture, we need to investigate them and understand them according to dependent origination. For example, if we want to be farmers, we need to see how the sunlight, the water, the minerals in the soil, excuse me, how the sunlight, the water, the minerals in the soil, and other things work in terms of dependent origination. If we understand all these dependent originating things, then we can be successful at farming or agriculture. Or in industry or manufacturing, we have to know how the machines work, how their parts fit together, the various laws of electricity and thermodynamics, the mechanics of all these things. If we understand these, the principle of dependent origination as it applies to machines and to manufacturing, then we can be, we can do very useful things with it. Even applying to the whole cosmos, if we wish to understand the whole cosmos, we have to understand the dependent origination of the, the sun, the moon, the planets, the stars, the interstellar gas, and all such things. So, in short, to understand anything, even inanimate things, well, <clears throat> we must understand them in terms of dependent origination. All technology just comes from dependent origination and we will have a useful technology if we understand it in this way. However, inanimate things, non-living things, don't have any problems about dukkha. They don't have feelings and so they don't experience dukkha. So, We'll speak specifically <clears throat> about the animate beings, the sentient beings that feel pleasure and pain, that experience dukkha, because this is where the problem lies. So allow us some time to review dependent origination as it applies to us human beings. And so we can observe it carefully and see how it applies to our own lives. The first point is that we have eyes, ears, nose, tongues, bodies, and minds with which to contact the things outside of us, 
that is the forms, sounds, odors, flavors, touches, and mental experiences. The first six are called the inner ayatana, or inner communicators, and the, the later six are the outer ayatana, or external communicators. This is the first level of Paticca Samupada. Then when the, the inner ayatana, such as the eye, makes contact with the outer ayatana, such as a form, then there arises eye consciousness, visual consciousness. And the same thing happens with the rest of the six ayatana. There are six kinds of consciousness, eye consciousness, ear consciousness, and so on. This is the second stage. Then, <clears throat> when these three things, the eye, the form, and eye consciousness, when these three things come together, when they meet and work together, we call this patsa, or contact. And this, the same thing happens with the ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind. You must observe that for it to be real contact, it involves three things, not just two. It has to be all three, especially including the consciousness, for there to be real contact. There's contact going on all the time, all day long. The eyes, the ears, the nose, the tongue, the body, the mind. Through one of these six doors, there's always some kind of contact going on, one after the other, endlessly. But we never bother to pay attention, so we don't observe it, we don't see it. But throughout the day, there's, there's always some kind of contact, if not the eyes, the ears, or the nose, or the tongue, going on on and on and on. So all the time there is this contact between the inner senses and the outer sense objects with vijnana or consciousness being the thing that knows or experiences, is aware of the, the contact. Now this point of contact that keeps happening over and over again is very important. It's a crossroads, or it's a, like a fork in the roads for us every time there is contact. If in the moment of contact, if in any moment of contact there is a lack of understanding and wisdom, if there is just avicca, ignorance, then it's an ignorant contact that follows the path to dukkha. If there's ignorance, the contact will, things will happen in a way that becomes dukkha. If, however, at that moment of contact there is wisdom, there is right understanding, there is knowledge, there is mindfulness, then it won't, it will proceed in a way that doesn't end up in dukkha. So this is the very important fork in the roads for us. Every moment of contact, if it's ignorant, then it goes towards, it ends up in dukkha. But if there's mindfulness and wisdom, then it does not cook up into dukkha. This is a very important point that you need to investigate deeply. Another point that we should make clear is that in some religions, in some sects, they take that contact, whether through the eyes or whatever, is self. That is, this sense contact is 
the self or the soul. But in Buddhism, we, we don't see it that way at all. In Buddhism, contact is understood to be merely a natural mechanism. It happens naturally. It is, there's nothing, there's no self or soul involved. So please notice the difference between Buddhism and certain other religions or philosophies. Now, if in this moment of contact, avicca, not knowing, happens, then if, if avicca, not knowing, or wrong knowing, dominates the contact, then we call it ignorant contact and things will happen ignorantly from there. But if in the moment of contact there is intelligence, there is wisdom, then we can call it intelligent or enlightened contact. Contact is the basis for Vedana. Due to contact, then, Vedana, or feeling, arises. If the contact is ignorant, then the feelings that arise from it will also be ignorant. You could even say stupid. The mind, this means that the mind will be deceived and tricked by the feelings. The positiveness or negativeness of the Vedana will deceive the mind and the mind will indulge in and get lost in those positive and negative vetana. But if it's an enlightened contact, if the contact is experienced with true understanding, then the vetana, any vetana that arise, will be enlightened vetana. They won't be ignorant. And so we won't get be tricked by the positiveness or negativeness of the Vedana. And so the mind won't get trapped in those Vedana. So there are these two kinds of Vedana, ignorant Vedana and enlightened Vedana. If the Vedana are ignorant, then we get sucked into the positiveness and negativeness of them. The gladness and sadness of the Vedana take over our minds, and this gives rise to all kinds of defilements, such as greed, lust, anger, and hatred, because of the ignorant Vedana. But if the Vedana are enlightened, then there's no positive, this positiveness or negativeness has no power over the mind. The mind doesn't get trapped in them. All that happens is a knowing, an understanding of what to do. When the Vedana arise, with intelligence one knows how to respond to them, what to do about them. And then there's no trouble due to the positiveness and negativeness of these Vedana. When there is Vedana, then there arises a kind of wanting or desire. Di desire arises due to the Vedana. If it's ignorant Vedana, then the wanting will be ignorant. It will be a blind, ignorant, foolish wanting. Depending on whether the Vedana is positive or negative, the desire will follow accordingly. Negative Vedana will lead to wanting to get, or positive Vedana leads to wanting to get, and negative Vedana leads to wanting to destroy. So the desires will, will happen according to one's personal feelings and inclinations when there is ignorant Vedana and then ignorant want. But if it's, if it's enlightened Vedana, then there won't arise any ignorant wants. 
Instead, there will just be understanding and wisdom about the Vedana. This understanding or wisdom will know what the Vedana are like and how they can stir up the mind into different kinds of problems. And so instead of wanting according to the positiveness or negativeness of the Vedana, there is just the want or desire to respond to any problems which have arisen. There is merely the want to solve any problems that have occurred. This kind of want is not ignorant. So, ignorant and enlightened Vedana lead to ignorant and enlightened want. So, Vedana gives rise to want. The word want for us is a neutral term. It's neither positive nor negative, good or bad or anything like that. But if the Vedana are ignorant, then the want which arises is also ignorant, foolish, blind. You could even call it stupid. We call this kind of blind, ignorant want, danha, danha, which we can translate as desire or craving. Danha, desire, craving, is always ignorant. But when the Vedana is enlightened, the wanting that arises is wise. There's nothing ignorant or blind about it. This, then, we can call wise want or aspiration. In Pali, the word is sankapa, sankapa, which is different than danha. There's a very, there's a very important and clear difference between wise aspiration or wise aim, sankapa, and danha. This wise aspiration will lead to progress, will lead to success in solving the dilemma of dukkha. Whereas Danha will just bring on more and more dukkha, pain, and trouble. Now when this Danha or ignorant desire occurs and then becomes stronger, more intense, it stirs up the concept that there is a desirer. Due to the ignorant desire, there arises the concept, the desirer, the one, the person who desires. So this is a concept of self or soul, ego, me, mine, me, I, whatever, whatever concept pops into the mind. Here is the conception of ego, self, me, of I, as the desirer, the one who desires. But if, the, if there isn't this danha, if there's been wisdom all along, then there's the aspiration. And then there doesn't arise any concept of self or soul. And then there's just mindfulness and understanding that continue to respond correctly to the situation. When things go wrong due to ignorance, Ignorant desire brings up the ignorant concept of self. The concept of self or soul is always ignorant and leads to even more trouble. But if it's wise want or aspiration, then this concept of self doesn't happen. This point here where ignorant desire leads to the concept of self is the heart of dependent origination. You ought to study how that this concept of self happens dozens, hundreds of times each day. You can see it happening inside yourself. See how many times this concept of self occurs. How many times there are these concepts of me, 
self, ego, soul, or whatever. See how many times it happens because this is the, the heart, the essence of dependent origination. <clears throat> then you will see, when you see it, you see that it is just a concept, that it's a concept, an idea about self or soul. It's not a real self or soul, it's just an idea, just a concept which is stirred up in the mind by ignorance and desire. Now some groups or teachings think that this self, this idea of self is permanent, that this self or soul lasts forever, that it just continues, that it's just going on steadily, that it doesn't fade away or disappear or change or anything like that. But in Buddhism, it's very clear that this, this self or soul or ego is just a concept, just an idea that arises temporarily. It's a temporary, momentary, impermanent thing. It just happens and it goes away. But if the conditions reoccur, then it happens again. But each time it's a different concept. It's not the same concept. It's a new one. But these keep happening over and over again. And so sometimes through ignorance, we blur them together and think that it's continuous, that there's really some kind of self. Please don't be deceived by the teachings of traditions that teach that there's some permanent, continuous, lasting self. Observe that it's just a concept that arises in the, is stirred up in the mind by ignorant desire. It's just a delusive concept or maya, maya, just a delusive concept that will trick us and get us into trouble. It doesn't have any real substance or meaning or any reality of its own. So in short, ignorance creates desire and desire creates the desirer, the self, the one who desires, the desirer, the self. Examine things clearly. That means watch how this happens inside the mind. Examine it clearly till you see how ignorance creates desire, which creates the desirer. And then there is this delusive concept of self. The kind of ignorance which creates the self is called upadana or attachment, clinging. Clinging to desire as the desirer, as self, is called upadana. And then it, this is the heart of dependent origination. If you understand dependent origination, you'll see that this is just ignorant, that it's not true or real. But because we don't understand dependent origination, we don't pay any attention to this, and we don't even know that it's going on. We ignore this fact of this attachment which is happening all the time in our lives. And so this attachment creates all kinds of problems of positiveness and negativeness, optimism and pessimism, sadness and gladness. So it's time we begin to observe this, to see how this attachment keeps happening in our lives. Through, through attachment, the self is established. The self is started. And so we say that the self now exists. 
this beginning to exist of the self is called existence or pawa pawa b h a v a existence this is the self has begun to exist it doesn't really exist but it exists ignorantly in the mind this is called bhava ignorant existence when through conception we're talking and when we talk materially through conception the fertilization of the egg by the sperm then the embryo is said to exist due to conception then we say the embryo exists that's on the material physical level on the spiritual level it's through the conception of self which we call attachment that then the self begins to exist so there's the conception of self and then the existence of self and then just like the embryo grows and develops as a fetus in the same way the self grows develops matures until it's fully mature or ripe and then it's born this birth so there's conception of self existence of self or development of self and then birth jati which is the birth of self the ignorant birth of self in the mind and the birth of self means that this fully matured self now will fully develop self will then perform some role will play some game according to the circumstances although it's not so difficult to see we never see this because we never bother to look it's not that hard it's pretty obvious if you pay attention how this self is born into the mind and then plays some little game works out some little personality or thing but we we don't bother to watch <coughs> the the birth the only kind of birth that we see that we pay attention to is physical birth when we're physically born from our mother's womb this is the only kind of birth we understand although it only happens once in a lifetime but this mental or spiritual birth of the ego happens over and over again every day the physical kind of birth isn't very important it's a thing of the past the birth that really matters is this birth of ego that's going on right now but this we don't we don't bother to pay attention to and so we don't understand it and then there's nothing we can do about it and so the ego is getting born and playing its games all the time when you hear the words in buddhism that birth is dukkha they mean the mental or spiritual birth of ego when we say that birth is dukkha we don't mean physical birth physical birth happens once and then the problem's done with it happened a long time ago when we say that birth is dukkha we mean this birth of ego in the mind this is the kind of birth that causes all our tr problems this is the kind of birth which is so much dukkha every time that the ego is born there will be dukkha there will be trouble the true meaning of the word birth is that something performs its function when something functions properly according to the its the meaning of its name we call that birth if it's not functioning we say that it ceases for example when 
the eyes are born when they perform the function of seeing. But when they're not seeing anything, then that they said to cease. The same with the ears, the nose, the tongue, and so on. When they function performing their activity of hearing or whatever, they're born. And when they stop doing that function, when they stop functioning, they're said to cease. So it's the same, the same with the self. The self is said to be born when it functions, when it, it plays the role according to the full meaning of the word self. This is what is meant by, by birth. And then when it doesn't function like that anymore, it's said to cease or quench. Now, you might find this amusing. You might even laugh or think we're crazy. But when the hand picks something up, we say the hand is born. Whenever the hand does some work, we say it's born. And when it stops doing that work, we say that it ceases or ends. So the hand is born and then it ceases. Or when we walk, when we take a step, the foot is born. But when we no longer use our feet to walk or to do something, we say they cease. So our hands, our feet, and all the other aspects of our bodies are born whenever they perform some function like this, and then they cease. The hands can be mo born many times in a day, and after each birth, they cease, and then they can be later born again. This is a spiritual way of speaking, but if you look at it materially, you may think we're crazy. So, when spiritually, when the self is born, when there's this kind of birth in terms of functioning, when the self functions, then there is dukkha. If the self isn't born, then there's no dukkha, there's no problem. It's only when the self functions, according to the meaning of the word self, that's the only time that there is dukkha. Because the self or atta, the self, soul, or atta is born from ignorance, this self functions ignorantly. That means that it thinks, I am, I exist, here I am. And then anything that it, it comes in contact with, it takes to be mine. This is the ignorant thinking and functioning of self. So, for example, this ignorant self <clears throat> thinks that physical birth is my birth. It takes just physical birth, which is just a natural biological process, and attaches to it as being my birth, and so makes a complicated problem out of birth. Or aging. This ignorant self takes the natural aging of the body and thinks of it as, I am getting old, or I am old. And so it makes a big problem out of getting old, out of aging. Or illness, which is just another natural thing. It happens naturally. But this ignorant self thinks, I am sick, I am ill and creates all kinds of problems and complications. And even death, which is just the natural consequence of physical birth, this ignorant self thinks about it as, I will die, I am going to die, I am dying, and creates dukkha out of this. So when the, the self functions ignorantly, 
there is atta, the self, this ignorant self. And then anything it comes into contact with becomes ataniya, things associated with self, belonging to self. So then first there's atta, self is born, and then ataniya, of self, is born. So everything becomes a mess. Things are positive, things are negative. They become complicated, busy, and dukkha because the self functions in this ignorant way. So the self is in the middle. And then all kinds of things which are of self or belonging to self are surrounding it. My, there's my family or the family of self becomes a problem. My possessions, my wealth, my fame, my honor, my... And then there are the political problems of mine, the economic problems of self, the social problems of self. So first there's this self in the middle and then all these things which are, all these problems are collected, are gathered at the self as of self. There's the self and then all these things are the problems of self or the burdens of self. All this self and of self is called the burden. Because of this burden, life becomes heavy. So we can call it the burden of life. Self and of self, atta and ataniya. Think for yourself how it would be if this concept of self never happened. If there wasn't this concept of self, and of self, of me and mine, then there wouldn't be any problems. You can, in, you can see this for yourself quite easily, that if there isn't any concept of self or of self, nothing's wrong, there's no problem, there's no hassles, there's no dukkha. But as soon as this ignorant concept of self, of atta, of of self, of mind, as soon as these are born, then life is full of trouble, full of problems, conflicts, stress, heaviness, sorrow, and dukkha. The difference between the life of self and the life without self is a tremendous one. You ought to think very carefully about this life where there isn't any concept of self or of self. If we want something but don't get it, that is dukkha. But if we want something and get it, that isn't dukkha. But if we go and grasp at it and cling to it, then it becomes dukkha. If you get what you want, at first it's not dukkha, but as soon as you attach to it as mine, then it becomes dukkha. So the, the essence of dukkha is this grasping and clinging. As soon as we attach to anything, then it becomes dukkha. This is the real heart or essence of dukkha, this grasping and clinging to things as being self or being of self, as being me or mine. In practical terms, if we look at this in order to see how to practice, we see that the, the moment of choice the moment of truth is at contact because it's at contact where things can either go one way or the other. First there are the ayatana, 
the inner communicators and the outer communicators. And there then arises sense consciousness. And then there is contact. Contact's the all-important moment. If it's ignorant contact, then it conditions ignorant vedana, ignorant desire, attachment to self, existence of self, and birth of self, which is all dukkha. But if at that moment of contact there is true mindfulness and wisdom, then that mindfulness and wisdom just carries on, knowing what's happening and responding appropriately without any attachment, without any concept of self, without any dukkha. So this moment of contact is the thing we have to be very careful about. We have to be very mindful and attentive to the moment of contact so that it is wise and doesn't get into the ignorant path of things. So please be very careful about this moment of contact, this moment of choice. This matter of dependent origination is just the subject of life. You can see, if you look at this, that this issue of dependent origination is another other than life itself. All we're talking about is life, what happens in life. And so it's something of importance to all of us. Paticca Samupata is the heart of Dhamma. It's the essence of Buddhism. Other religions such as Christianity or Hinduism cannot be found to teach dependent origination. You won't find the teaching of dependent origination in the Bible or in the Hindu scriptures or in the other religions. This is an understanding and teaching found only in Buddhism. In order that we can get rid of all dukkha, so that we can eliminate dukkha from our lives according to the method of Buddhism. Something else you ought to know about has to do with the fact that dependent origination, as we've been investigating it today, is rather long. The ayatana consciousness, contact, and so on like nine or ten things. But you should also be aware that the Buddha spoke of it in a more condensed form. A very common thing that the Buddha spoke about are or is the five khandas, the five aggregates. And these five aggregates are nothing other, nothing other than a condensed version of Paticca Samupada. So this is also something you should know about. This subject of the five khandas separates life into five parts or sections. One section is the physical, material aspect of life which is called rupa, form, or more simply, body. And then there are four aspects or sections which are nama, which means name, but in principle it's the mind. So life is distinct, is categorized into five areas, one physical and four mental. These are the five khandas or sections of life. The first section is called rupa khanda or the, <clears throat> the form khanda. 
This is made up of the body and all the things connected to the body. And it also includes the nervous system, which means Rupa Khanda also includes the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, and body sense, the skin. And then all the nerves, including the brain, connected to that. This is the Rupa Khanda. Or if you look into it in more detail, you, we speak of it as the earth element, the water element, wind element, fire element, and space element. Earth element is solidity. Water element is what holds things together, cohesion. And the wind element is movement. And then the fire element is temperature or energy. And then space is where all the rest of the elements can happen. So you can... These, this is what makes up Rupa Khanda or the the physical, the body aggregate, the, bo the, the body section. When the Rupa Khanda or the, the form aggregate, the body functions, that means there's sense activity through the eyes, ears, or whatever. Then there are results or reactions on the mental side of life. First of all, when there's, when the, when the body aggregate functions, then there arises vetana. There's a feeling of pleasantness or unpleasantness, or you could just say positive and negative feelings. And then this gives rise to sanya kanda which is to regard and classify things as being this or being that, to regard them and classify them. And then there is Sankara Khanda, which is to, to con conceive and think about all these things. So Sankara Khanda is thinking. And then there is Vijnana Khanda, which is consciousness of all these different things. Consciousness of the, of the body through which we can experience the world and then consciousness of the Vedana, consciousness of the Sanya or the recognitions and classifications and conscious, consciousness of thinking and thoughts. These are the, the five, all of the five khandas or sections of life. When the first one, the physical one, functions, then there will be results leading to the four mental khandas, vetana, sanya, or recognition um, regarding classifying, and then sankhara, thought conception and thinking, and then vijnana, consciousness. It's interesting that vijnana khanda, the consciousness aggregate, comes last because it actually functions everywhere. When rupa khanda functions, then vijnana, when the body functions, then consciousness comes into play in order to see, hear, smell, etc. And then when Vedana arises, it's through Vijnana Khanda that we are conscious of, of the feel pleasant, positive, or unpleasant, negative feelings. And then when there's the classification of things, such as blue, red, white, yellow, or sweet, salty, sour, Vijnana is what knows that classifying and then all the thoughts and thinking. So Vijnana Khanda is listed fifth, but it works everywhere. 
So these five khandas then are a, a condensed version of dependent origination because as you can see they depend on each other. There's, each of them arises dependent upon others. So there's this mutual or interdependent conditioning of these five khandas. So we're talking about the same thing as dependent origination. We're talking about life. But it's, when we speak of the five khandas, it's a more condensed version. But it's still dependent origination. Before the Buddha's time, the Indians already knew about these five khandas. The Buddha didn't discover them or make them up or anything, but they were already known by the Indians. However, they were known in terms of um, medicine or in terms of psychology. And then some even went so far as to take the five khandas as being self in their philosophical or religious systems. They would speak of self of the in terms of the five khandas that the body is self or vetana is self or the recognitions and classifications are self or that thoughts are self or that consciousness is self. This was a misunderstanding but this is the way they understood the khandas. But when the Buddha came along the Buddha denied all that. The Buddha said, no, none of these khandas are self. They're impermanent, they're changing, they're temporary. None of them can be taken as self. All of the five khandas are not self. And so what's called Buddhism now is a denial of the belief or the theories that the five khandas are self. Buddhism is the teaching of not-self. All of these khandas, all of dependent origination, all of life is not-self. And when we, when we realize this, then the ego is not concocted anymore. And so there's no problems, there's no dukkha in life. This is the purpose of Buddhism. In Mahayana Buddhism, they speak more about the five khandas or aggregates than they talk about dependent origination. They also talk about Paticca Samupada, but not as much as they talk about the five khandas. If you look at the most important sutras, of Mahayana Buddhism. If you take the most important ones, you'll see that they all end with the five khandas. The Mahayana sutras are much longer than in Theravada Buddhism. They may start by talking about the all kinds of bodhisattvas and some the so-called pure lands and heavens and all kinds of very elaborate things. Sometimes they spend a lot of time on abstract philosophical questions. But at the end, they always get around to the five khandas and making the point clear that the five khandas are not self or that the five khandas are void of self. This is because the... So, the five khandas are central teaching in Mahayana Buddhism. It's a little easier to understand the five khandas for those whose intelligence is not fully ripe or fully mature. It's a little easier to understand than dependent origination. So it's more appropriate when you're trying to reach large numbers of people to speak in terms of the five khandas. But don't think that it's something different than dependent origination. 
it's still the same thing but in a more condensed, easier form, easier to understand, easier to practice, easier to manage and regulate. Whether we speak in terms of five khandhas or in terms of dependent origination, the essence or heart of the matter is not self. This is the, what Buddhism is all about. The body is not self. The Vedana khanda is not self. The, the regardings and classifyings are not self. The thoughts and thinking is not self. Consciousness is not self. All of the five khandas are not self. Individually or all together, they are not self. Or the inner ayatana, the eyes and so forth, are not self. The outer ayatana are not self. The, the eye consciousness, ear consciousness and so on are not self. Contact is not self. Vetana is not self. Danha is not self. Attachment is not self. And the rest is not self. Either way of speaking, the, the essence of it is that all these things are not self. This is the, the heart of Buddhism. This is what Buddhism is all about, the teaching of not-self. Or sometimes we put it even more strongly. We say that Buddhism is the teaching of no man, or you could say no woman as well. Or it's the teaching of no one. Buddhism is the teaching of no one because the central teaching is anatta or not-self. There isn't anything which is self. Everything whatsoever, you won't find any exception anywhere in the universe, is not-self. There isn't a real self anywhere what people call self, soul, ego, atman, atta, whatever, is just a concept created by ignorance. It's just an ignorant concept. So, you may laugh, you may ha-ha and ho-ho when we say this, but we are the we which is not really we. We are a we which is not really we. This may sound funny to you, you may laugh or think we're crazy, but this is the truth, this is what Buddhism is all about. We are the we that isn't really a we. Next we come to the question then, how, what are we going to do about this? How are we going to practice according to things? The problem is that we lack panya, panya, or intuitive wisdom. We lack the intuitive wisdom that all things are not self. And so it's very difficult for us to practice. And further, we lack the thing which will bring the that wisdom and apply it to all the different things in life. That is, we lack sati, mindfulness, which is kind of the vehicle or the delivery system, the delivery mechanism for wisdom. This is our problem. We lack wisdom and we lack mindfulness. So how are we going to deal with the fact that all these things are not self. Why is it that this concept of self is born over and over again all day long? Why is our life full of this concept of self, of these ideas about self? The reason is because we lack mindfulness 
and the intuitive wisdom that knows that all things are not self. Because we lack mindfulness and true understanding, then the concept of self keeps getting born throughout our lives. We lack the understanding of dependent origination. If we really understood dependent origination, then we would not go and conceive of things as being self, as being me. There's a religious parable or fable which is useful to bring up at this time. There was a monkey, he was king of a local group of monkeys, and this was a special monkey such that it was called a bodhisattva or Buddha-to-be. This monkey was captured and taken into the city where he was kept by the king. And he lived in the palace and in the city for a while until the king got bored. And then then the monkey was released. So when the monkey came back from the city where it had viewed the life of court and market and everything. Then all the monkeys gathered around and asked, what was it like? What did you see? What, what is it like in the human city? And the monkey said, there isn't anything there. They haven't got anything except my money, my possessions, my husband, my wife, my children, my work, my job, my car, my this, my that. Nothing but me, me, mine, mine, all day long and all day night. That's all they talk about is me, me, mine, mine. And then when all the monkeys heard this, they ran to the nearest river and started washing out their ears because they had heard such filthy and disgusting words. They had never heard such filthy things before. And so they washed out their ears. This is the parable of the monkeys washing their ears. It can be found (coughs) in a part of the old text that collects such fables and stories. So, in short, we need sufficient panya, intuitive wisdom. We need sufficient sati, attentiveness or mindfulness. We need sufficient sampachanya, which is applied wisdom. When we've developed intuitive wisdom, it's kind of stored up, and then we need the ability to apply it to every situation. This is called sampachanya. It's ready, active, applied wisdom in action. And we need samati which is the strength and power of mind. In fact, all of these four things, wisdom, mindfulness, wisdom in action, and samati, exist naturally. We all have these from birth, but they're not enough, they're too little. And so they need to be developed and trained until they are adequate to do the job. So this is why we ask you to to study and practice mindfulness with breathing. If you will learn how to practice this and then practice it completely in all four areas as you're being taught over at the meditation center, if you practice it successfully, then you will have these four things um, sufficiently. You'll have enough wisdom, mindfulness, wisdom in action, and concentration in order to prevent yourself from being tricked by things. You'll have enough mindfulness so that nothing will deceive you into cooking up self and 
things that belong to self. You won't fall for any more atta or ataniya. And then there won't be anything that can cause you trouble ever again. The meditation system, which is called anapanasati, will enable us to study and understand all the important secrets of life. We'll investigate until we thoroughly understand the, the hidden secrets of the body or of the gaya the body and then to investigate the secrets of the vetana the feelings and then there are the the very subtle secrets of the jitta the mind and then lastly the secrets of the natures of all the natural things that trick us into attaching to them as me and mine which we call dhamma, dhammas. These, the system of practice we're teaching here will investigate these four kinds of secrets, those of the body, of the feelings, of the mind, and of all the dhammas we cling to as me and mine. The your instructor at the meditation center will explain this to you fully. Please listen carefully, think things through, and ask any necessary questions so that you understand how to practice. And then do yourself your best to train according to this system of practice so that you will discover the secrets, these different secrets of life. The secret of the body is that there are two bodies. Here the word kaya or body means group. So there are two groups. There's the, the flesh body. That means in this body there's all the physical things that make up our flesh and blood body. And then there's a second body called the breath body, or you could call it the prana body or pana body. And that using this breath body, which just means you're breathing, one can control the flesh and blood body. This is the secret of the body that we discover through anapanasati. We discover this secret and then learn how to exploit it for our benefit. So we, we train the breathing to be very calm, quiet, and peaceful. And then the flesh body also becomes calm and peaceful. You don't have to directly try and calm down the body. Just make the breathing calm and peaceful. And the breath body will also be calm and peaceful. This is the, the key lesson regarding the bodies. The next stage of practice is about the vetana or feelings, which means the exact same thing as the Vedana we talked about in dependent origination. So you understand that the Vedana stir up or concoct all kinds of concepts and thoughts. So the, this is the secret of the Vedana, how they, they concoct concepts and thoughts and ideas. So we need to train with the Vedana so that they don't create any harmful or evil thoughts and concepts, so that the Vedana only bring up thoughts which are useful, which are peaceful and healthy. So the essence of the second stage of practice is to be able to 
master the vetana so that they don't stir up any thoughts or concepts which create dukkha. The third group of lessons or area is about the jitta or the mind. Usually we just translate it as mind, but we could also translate it as consciousness. But it's easier to just translate it as mind. And it includes all the things meant by mind, consciousness, and heart. In this we first investigate all the different kinds of mind all the different possibilities the mind can assume. And then once we've seen all these different kinds of mind, then we choose those kinds of mind which are the best, which are the most useful for and beneficial for our spiritual life. First of all, we, we make the mind happy. We make the mind, we give it a delight in joy, we make it joyful. And then we, we make it stable. We make it very stable so it has a very strong, certain samadhi. And then we make it release, we make it let go. We make the mind free itself from everything. We learn to control and train the mind in these different ways. This is the third lesson or third group of lessons of Anapanasati. The last group of lessons, the final stage of practice, is about nature or Dhamma. Here we mean all the natures that trick us into attaching to them as positive sometimes or as negative other times. They're all the natural things that we keep clinging to as being positive and negative. So we need to study what their real nature is, what the facts of these things are. And so we <coughs> look deeply in order to see that in fact all of these things are not self. That although they've tricked us into attaching to them as positive and negative, and this has stirred up the concept of self, we see that in fact all of these natures, all of these dhammas are not self. This is the very important lesson that we must give a lot of attention and effort to. That makes up the fourth group of lessons of Anapanasati. In a short period of just 10 days, you probably won't be able to complete this training in all four areas. But in 10 days, you might be able to understand how to practice. You probably won't be able to finish the training, but you might be able to understand how to do it. And so then just do your best to understand how to practice anapanasati and then just keep working on it, keep trying continually until you are successful in all four stages of practice. Then you will thoroughly understand dependent origination. You will have mindfulness whenever you need it. You will have wisdom you'll have all the intuitive wisdom you need. You'll have all the sampachanya, the ability to apply wisdom to every possible situation. And you'll have all the samati, all the stability, strength, concentration of mind you need. So that you understand dependent origination, and so that you understand the five khandhas and know that none of them our self. You realize that all the modes and linkages of dependent origination are not self, that each of the khandhas is not self. And you'll have the ability to manage these things. You can manage the flow of dependent origination. You can manage the khandhas 
so they don't give rise to the concept of self anymore. And then you are finished. You will have solved all your problem. So we can summarize all that has been said in these talks that there's really just two things you need to do. First, to study dependent origination, investigate and train with Paticca Samupata until you thoroughly realize it. And then train yourself with the system of practice called mindfulness with breathing until you have the ability to manage the stream of dependent origination so that it doesn't create any dukkha anymore. That's all that we need to do. Study dependent origination and practice anapanasati. If we do this correctly, completely, then there won't be any more dukkha. This is the heart of the Dhamma. So thank you for listening and being with us once again. We hope that these, your effort in listening will be very useful for you, that you will now have an overview, an introduction to what you need to do, and that then you will continue to study dependent origination and practice anapanasati that you will have the confidence and the, the appetite to do this seriously, continually, with commitment. So please carry on with your study and practice, and we wish you great success in them, and hope that you can free yourself from the dukkha of me and mine.